Over the many years that I've been following Jesus, it's probably been, I don't know, 30 some years now, uh, I have a lot of conversations about faith, certainly over the years. And I've had a lot of friends and people in and out of my life. And I've had a lot of friends and people that I've worked with that aren't people of faith. They don't go to church anywhere. They're not really into the whole Jesus thing. And you may have some people in your life like that. In fact, it's even kind of awkward to even say what you do on Sunday morning sometimes. They're like, why would you do that? We're in a different you know, time and place in the world. And you might have conversations, and, and, and this is a conversation that I've heard a lot, uh, where, where someone will say to me, someone that I have a relationship with, and they'll say, hey, Ben, uh, really, really admire you for your faith. It's cool that you believe in God and church and the Jesus thing. Good for you. Glad you, 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 you're into that. I, I can admi- I let you do that. But I got to tell you, Ben, I, I really don't believe. I really wish I could. I wish I could believe, you know, like you, but I, I just don't. I, I don't have it. But then the conversation shifts and says, but, but if, but I tell you what, Ben, if God, if God showed up right in front of me, showed up right in front of me and did this fill in the blank miracle then I would believe and I've wondered about that you know what sort of miracle would it take in that situation for someone to cross from not having any faith in Jesus not believe it at all to following Jesus what would that miracle have to be I'm guessing it would have to be a pretty big game changing miracle Uh, like you're messing with the, the, the natural science of the world. You're, you're doing something so radical. You're literally moving a mountain or something. But then I wonder, if God really did that for them, would that do it? Would it? I mean, you think it would? They'd be like, okay, I'm in then. You know, some of us that are more skeptical would be like, well, I'm not sure if that was a real miracle. Uh, maybe that there's some, 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 some smoke and mirrors there, God. You really didn't. We, we are very skeptical uh, uh, that way. Uh, a little jaded, maybe. I don't know. But, but if God really did that for someone in your life and showed up and did this miraculous thing, would it actually do the trick? Now, now, maybe you, r- raise your hands, if you had a conversation kind of like that, maybe not, maybe not exactly like that, but if you had some conversations like that with people and you're trying to say why you believe or why you would be part of a church, you're, you're trying to have that conversation and it, it's hard because some people, I think, uh, they tell themselves, if I just saw this big thing, then I would believe. And I, I just suspect that it, probably no matter what, may not, may not do it for them. And the thing is, when we get those conversations, when we get those questions, we're kind of at a loss for what to do. Because it's not like you and I can manufacture a miracle. That's kind of God's domain. We don't don't do that part. And so we're left wondering, well, what what is it going to take for someone uh, to to really cross over into faith? We've been in this series now we call Miracles for several weeks now. And what we've been doing is sort of looking at all the different camera angles on the miracles of Jesus. And, and we said in week one, there's about 37, depending on how you count them, about 37 miracles of Jesus recorded in the scriptures. And we said at the beginning, right, if we were to just use that 37 number, are, are some of us right now in need of number 38? Are some of us here in need of, of a miracle? And maybe you're coming from a rough week this week. I don't know what it is for you in your life where you feel like you want God to come through in a miraculous way. And maybe it's a relationship thing or if it's a financial thing, it's a career thing, a family thing, something where you need God to come in big time. You need that miracle. You need that 38th miracle of Jesus. And we've been asking that question, right? Boldly asking the question, what if God did what you asked him to do? What if he did step in and, and show, show up big time. You know, we've been saying how Jesus had command over, uh, well, he had command over making water to wine. That was week one. He had command over supply and materials, right? He had command over that. Then we talked about how he has command over uh, physical body. That there were times he did physical healings. And uh, in many ways, sometimes he did those miracles and the people, the, the person that he healed wasn't even the person that had the faith. And we, we saw how he could even do miracles long distance. 
and heal people. I mean, that's, that's a command over a lot of stuff right there. And then last week, if you've been following along, Andrew talked about the idea that, that Jesus was kind of a master fisherman and that uh, he just seemed to know right where to throw those nets. And not only that, but turns out he could cook too. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> Jesus was the, the cook fisherman there. If you don't know that story, it's the end of John's gospel, John 21. Pretty cool that Jesus cooks a little food. Be interested to see what the food tasted like. You ever wonder how good of a cook Jesus was? I don't know. But we, we see that he had command over all that. And we're gonna see today that he had command, he has command even over the natural elements in the world. Over earth science, he has that ability. And, and we're going to come back to that question. What do you need God to do for you? What miraculous thing do you need him to do? I'm Pastor Ben. I'm glad you're with us today, whether that be here in person or online. We see you. Hello. Welcome. We, we gather like this on Sunday mornings. And we say this a lot around here, like Christ followers all over the globe. Uh, we are part of a one big dysfunctional family of faith, global. And we gather on Sundays to lift up the name of Jesus because on that Sunday so long ago, that tomb was empty and it changed human history forever. It changed many of our hearts right in this room. So that's why we gather like this, to lift up the name of Jesus. Take, I'm gonna to count to three. I want you to take a deep breath, get a good reset. We do this a lot too, right? One, two, three, deep breath. All right, we're gonna let it out. Let's pray. Father, you're so good and powerful and mighty. We're thankful that you're in charge and we're not. And today we lean into your scriptures, lean into your word, teach us by the power of your Holy Spirit about the miraculous things you're still doing in the world. We thank you for the testimony of the gospel writers and the early church leaders, but Lord, we know you're still working and operating and moving. So Lord, we pray boldly for miracles today in our lives, in Jesus' name, amen. If you have a Bible or a device where you have the scriptures on it, your smartphone, find Mark chapter four. And some of you are familiar with this story, and you probably knew as soon as you heard the title which story we might be going to in the narratives of Jesus. But in the, in the scriptures in the New Testament, I like to call it the, the New Covenant part of the Bible, kind of a bad terminology there. But in the new part, if you will, the scriptures, although it's 2,000 years old. Okay, I digress. Anyway, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We have the four gospel accounts. They're all kind of told from a different camera angle, uh, different audiences, different things that, that the writers felt like the, the audiences needed to hear about the different kinds of miracles. And sometimes you'll see the same event recorded multiple, by multiple accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, often. Uh, so this account that we're about to read in Mark 4 is echoed in Matthew chapter 8 and Luke chapter 8. And different, in fact, I, I challenge you this week to read those other accounts because it helps fill out the story maybe a little bit more. I love what Mark does in his account because it really shows some powerful things about Jesus, and we're going to see that. So Mark chapter 4 is where we're going to be. And again, oftentimes, these miracles, these signs were for a purpose. They weren't just Jesus showing off. They actually had a purpose. There was a reason behind why he was doing what he was doing, and this is, is also true today. So Mark chapter 4, I'm going to start with verse 35. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version, but you might have a different version, and that's, that's okay. But I'll start reading in verse 35. Now, on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. Now, a little background, he's been teaching parables, and those are often stories with a point. <laughs> and so he's been teaching a lot of parables, and it's been a long day, and he decides, you know, let's, let's kind of leave this spot and go, basically go across the lake. And I, I know we don't have time to unpack it all, but the Sea of Galilee, uh, that's where they spent a lot of their time in, in, in the first century, especially Jesus and his followers, around this area of, of uh, ancient Israel. And the Sea of Galilee, they were on the east side, and Jesus wants to go to the west side. And we'll talk about what was on the west side, because it's really important. But Jesus said, hey, let, let's, let's take a little boat ride. Uh, I've been teaching all day, and so here we are. Let's, let's just go to the other side. And uh, leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with them. Interesting that Mark adds that little tidbit. There were other boats around them. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling up. Now, I've been on the ocean. And anything like that would freak me out. 
If, if it's so bad, water is filling up the boat, you're thinking, this is my last day. They're on the Sea of Galilee, and I know you're thinking, well, they're not on the ocean. Well, this is a pretty big body of water, and the way it was situated, we'll talk about that, it was prone to having some pretty bad windstorms. If water's getting in the boat, there's a problem. So water's breaking in, filling the boat. There was no bilge pumps back in the day, okay? It, you're bailing with whatever you got, and the boat is filling up. But, but he, that is Jesus, what's going on with him? Well, he's in the stern asleep on the cushion. Interesting human side of that. He's on a cushion, sleeping. Was, was he really sleeping? See, I have so many questions on this story. I love this story. But okay, so he's sleeping on the cushion. You've already got questions too. I know you're asking questions in your head. Well, they, they had to wake him up, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and, the, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. What did that feel like? After all that adrenaline, that emotion, you're, 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 you're freaking out. You know, your, your rabbi Jesus seems unconcerned. Sleeping. How was he sleeping when the water is getting into the boat? Was he sleeping with one eye open to see what these guys would do? I don't know. Interesting details. But there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear. I mean, Jesus brought the great calm. And now Mark tells us they got some great fear going on when they just saw what he just did. And they said to one another, well, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? I can't imagine the emotional roller coaster that this little trip cost them. I mean, when you think about it, they, these guys knew the Sea of Galilee. Many of them did. I mean, weren't four of them fishermen? They knew the Sea of Galilee. They knew it was prone to having these sudden windstorms. In fact, that still happens today, by the way. And part of the reason is the Sea of Galilee is about 700 feet below sea level, and then it's surrounded by kind of a ridge of hills and, and not necessarily mountains like we think of, but enough elevation where it's just right for that wind to come whipping down out of the desert right into that little, that little lake, and it caused all kinds of crazy crazy waves, and it's very dangerous when it, when it got that bad. These guys knew this lake, right? And they're fishermen, and this thing comes up. And I, I wonder, I have, I have questions, okay? I, I, I'm, I'm going to ask the questions. Were, were they not prepared? i got to ask the question. I mean, they know the lake. You know, did they not have the, you, you know, their, their buckets to... You know, that stuff comes up. Or were, were they not paying attention? What was happening? Why is Jesus asleep, sound asleep, so to speak, in the boat? Uh, I have questions is my point. And, and well, what, about, what, about their, what are they feeling when it's so bad the boat is filling with water? I mean, what are you thinking in those moments? Are you thinking this is a great opportunity to grow in faith? Is that what you're thinking? Because if you were, you're weird. The rest of us are going to be saying, we're going to die. In fact, that's even what they tell Jesus. Do you not care? Which is kind of a loaded question. Did you catch that? Do you not care? It seems like a loaded question. Of course he cares. But it seems kind of a dig a little bit. I don't know. Like a backhanded sort of comment. Don't you care that we're perishing? Like, are you ignoring this situation? So I have questions. Jesus is on a cushion. Is it waterproof? I don't, these are the things that keep me up at night. You're welcome. <laughs> then you have these, these, this smelly football team. Uh, in this boat, there's, there's salt water all around. Or not salt water, but it was freshwater lake. The Dead Sea, of course, has salt water, but that's a whole different situation. They're in this boat, and they know they're going to die, or they sense they're going to die. And Jesus is sleeping on a cushion. Let me just play Bible nerd with you for a second. 
Can you think of any other situation where there was kind of a prophet of God, i to be careful how I say this, don't want to give away, a prophet of God that was supposed to go on a mission and, and, and do God's will, and, a, and, a, and then all of a sudden they're sleeping on a boat in the middle of a storm. You think of an Old Testament story that kind of sounds like that? Jonah, right? Now, obviously Jesus, he's running to God's will, so he was going to cross the lake to bring God's word to the east side of the lake. You know what was on the east side of the lake? Not the Jewish enclave. Those were Greek cities. They call it the, the Decapolis. Those were Greek cities. Those were, those were not Jews. Jesus was crossing the lake intentionally to the east side to bring God's word to people who weren't Jewish. Sounds kind of like Nineveh. Except Jonah was running the other way. Yeah, I'm not going to do God's will. I'm running that way. And Jesus is running to God's will. Interesting parallel. Have you ever thought about that? Boat, sleeping, what calms the sea? Obviously, in this case, it's a little different because Jesus wasn't tossed out of the boat. But you have a situation of God calming the sea, and there was a great calm. Look up Jonah this next week and just see how much parallels. I mean, some scholars think maybe Jesus was sleeping with one eye open. Remember, he was a rabbi. Everything rabbis do is generally for a point. Do you wonder if he's sleeping there with one eye open going, Did anybody, is anybody catching this? Is, any, is anybody noticing what, I'm, what we're doing here? Now, the disciples would have known their text. Many of these disciples would have been probably in the Pharisee camp. And they prided themselves on knowing God's word. Now, yes, people say, well, those weren't, these fishermen, they were, they were illiterate. Remember, we're, we're staring back at history with one of these in our hands. Many of us have multiple copies of this thing, and we don't even read them. In their culture, the way that these stories were transferred was an oral tradition. And you better bet that those disciples knew those stories. And so Jesus sleeping on a cushion Someone might have been alerted. This, there's some, we've heard this before. We've heard this story somewhere before. Interesting, isn't it? But he can control nature. I don't even know what these guys did after that. I mean, a great calm, and they're great, they got great fear going on. What was it like hearing them tell this story in person? If you were to sit down with them, you got to sit down with John Mark, you know, over a cup of coffee, and say, what was that like? Because think about it. Put yourself in the boat for a second. Were you that person on the boat before the sea gets calmed? Are you that person that's sitting back saying, you know, we got Jesus. We're all good. Are you that person? Again, you weirdo. The rest of us, sorry. The rest of us would have been bailing water, trying to do whatever we can, rowing like crazy. I don't even know if they were rowing at that point. You would have been trying to save your skin and panicked. Adrenaline, what happens when we get adrenaline? It's like we're fight or flight going on. This is all happening. And, and so they wake Jesus up thinking maybe he can do something. Don't you care? We're going to die, which means you too, Jesus. What are we going to do? The water's in the boat. And Jesus does this crazy change human knowledge of the way the world works situation, stops the storm, and then, of course, Jesus feels like it's a good time to give them a little lesson on faith. I don't know if they would have been hearing it at that time because there was a great calm then. And now who are you on the boat? Are you that person going, I knew he could do it the whole time, so I wasn't, I wasn't really worried. These, this, I got allergies. I'm not, I wasn't crying. That, that may be you. The rest of us, I would have been angry, okay, if I'm honest. Uh, you know why? Why didn't you step in earlier? Were you just sitting there sleeping, and we're going to die, and I might have been a little angry. Maybe you would have been, too. You'd be like, Is that, was that really necessary? Okay. <laughs> Who would you have been on the boat? And when, when, it, when it's all quiet, and you're all looking at each other on the boat, who is this guy that can do that? Nobody does that. I mean... I don't know that you're the same person after that. If you see that happen, I don't know that you're the same. But think about every party you go to from the rest of your life. 
Every party, people are talking about their stories, they're doing small talk, and someone's bragging about, hey, I've been to Rome and I've seen the Colosseum, and you're waiting because you, you know that you've got the story of a lifetime. <laughs> because you can say, well, actually, I was on this boat to the Sea of Galilee, you might have heard of it. Uh, there's this prophet guy named Jesus, you heard of him? I don't know if you heard of him. You would have the story of a lifetime, but he can control nature. That's just not normal. Now, we won't have time to go, go through what happens next, but they do end up getting to the other side of the lake. And uh, the next story that shows up is this account of a demon-possessed man who's had horrible, horrible time with, you know, I would say we'd almost look at his, his mental illness taken up a whole hundred time notch. And this guy's cutting himself, and, and it's very horrible for this, this guy. And Jesus shows up, shows compassion on this guy. Not a Jew. Because which side of the lake are we on now? We're on the Greek side. And I'm sure some of what was frustrating about these disciples are going, I don't want to go to that side because all the Gentiles are there. And here's Jesus running into it. And he heals this guy. The demon starts talking to Jesus. It's a weird thing. I don't know. I, I can't unpack all this. But the demons say, Jesus, don't cast us into some abyss. Different translations will say something different. But don't just get rid of us, Jesus. Give us somewhere to go. And can we go to the pigs? And Jesus is okay. Jesus did not put the pigs in the water. I've heard people use that story and say, well, Jesus just doesn't like pigs. That is not what happened in the story. What happened is the demons go into the pigs, and what do the pigs decide to do? In the water. Jesus did not have anything to do with that. Because sometimes people pull the whole, you know, Jews didn't like pork, and so he wouldn't like pigs. That is not what the scriptures say. But here we go. We have these stories of Jesus having command over the natural elements, and then Jesus having the command over the spiritual elements, the physical and the spiritual. And I think he wanted to show his disciples, I got this whole thing. I got all the domains covered. You do not need to fear. Why were you afraid, he asked him on the boat. What about your faith? Don't you have so little faith? I have command over all of this. And I got you. That's what I think he wants us to, to hear. I've got this. We've been bringing this back around every time. Right? What do you need God to do? What is it going to take in your life? that maybe you'll trust him for the first time or you'll continue to trust him? Is there something, a miracle that you need that maybe you've been afraid to ask for? Because what I see in scripture is sometimes people ask for big things and sometimes God says, okay, here we go. God will answer your prayers. Now, not, only in, not always in our timing and that sort of thing. We, we know that. But what do you need in your life right now? What will it take? Maybe some of you are thinking today, you know what? Ben, I need the sun to stand still. I need a major miracle. You know, I've got a relationship that's hemorrhaging, or I want to be in a relationship, or I've got a situation where the kids are going crazy, or my grandkids are going crazy, or I'm financially a wreck. And you need God to step in in a big way. What is it going to take for you today? Are you bold enough to ask for the miracle? Because we just read that Jesus has command over all realms, physical, spiritual, has, his, his hand is over science and over all of that. He, he has the whole world in his hands, if you will. How would you react if God did something like he did on that lake that day? Would it be forever settled for you? Never distrust him again? It's not really what happened to the disciples. They still struggled. And I think we would too. You know what? I also think we're forgetful. God does something big in our life. You know, we know he did it because there's no power in us that could have done it. And we'll forget about it. And then we'll get into a bad spot again. And we're like, oh, God never does what I, he never answers prayer. And we forget what he's already brought us through. Jesus has command over all of that. And the thing is, I wonder if he showed up for you, what would that do for you? Because I believe that God still wants to do the miraculous in our lives and your life. I read a book over the Christmas break by Mitch Albom. Uh, some of you might be familiar with him. I think he wrote Five Minutes in Heaven. Is that the same guy? Uh, anyway, um, check me on that. But, but he wrote a book called A Stranger in the Boat. And it, it's really kind of a, an interesting 
take on, it's a fiction book, okay? You're not going to agree with everything. I, I, yeah, okay. But I love fiction. I love reading stories. And this is a story that kind of hints at this idea of what if God actually did what you asked him to do? How would it work for you? Would it even work? If God did exactly what you wanted, would you, st would you be happy? And so in this book, we have this, this, there's this boat wreck, and I want to give it away if you, if you haven't read it yet, but there's this big boat wreck, and only a few people made it out alive. And they're huddled to a, a, a sinking life raft, and there's, you know, 10 or 12 of them on this life raft, and so they, 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 they're bumping into each other. It's stormy seas. They're in the middle of nowhere. They don't see land anywhere. And as they're struggling through this, they see a, a stranger a couple of days into their little, you know, wreck, they see a stranger kind of out treading water without any life jacket or anything on. He's out there treading water, and so they work to, they, to try to get over to him, they bring him in the boat, and, and, um, and, and let me read the dialogue that happens, okay? What's your real story, mister? Lambert asked. I'm here, said the stranger. Why are you here, Nina asked. Haven't you been calling me? We glanced at one another. We are a pathetic looking lot. Faces blistered by the sun, clothes crusted by salt water. We can't fully stand up without falling into someone. The floor smells like rubber, glue, and vomit. It's true, most of us at some point thrashing in the waves that first night or so, staring out into the empty horizon in the days that followed, we have cried out for divine intervention. Please, Lord, help us, God. Is, is, is that what this new man meant? Haven't you been calling me? See, in this story, God actually shows up. And as you'd expect, does anybody believe? You'll have to find out and read the book. <laughs> I'm not going to spoil it for you. But what if God showed up, right? What if he showed up? What if he did exactly what you asked? Would you believe it? Would you accept it? So I believe God is still doing miracles. And yes, he's probably not going to answer my request for a brand new Tesla anytime soon, okay? That is a little selfish. I recognize that, and I'm being silly. But sometimes we have real need in our lives, and we're asking God to step in. And I believe he still wants to do that. And it's going to be on his time. I get that. But, but do you believe he can deliver? Do you believe that storm in your life he could bring calm to? Right, that calm. Could, could, could you believe that? Uh, one scholar that I read said this about the miracles of Jesus, and it's a good time to read this as we've gone kind of three or four weeks into this series. These miracles, there was a lot of them. And these miracles that Jesus did were of all kinds of variety. They covered all possible areas of authority. They were done publicly. They were done uh, in strategic locations. Uh, they were performed before large crowds. There was no special place in which the miracles occurred. There was no special time when they were performed. Uh, they were performed in front of Gentiles as well as Jews. They were done without props. They were done with restraint. The miracles were beneficial to humanity. They were not done for Jesus' own advantage. And they met real needs. They were done with great ease. Eyewitnesses recorded the miracles. In fact, those who saw the miracles had the same reaction that you and I probably would have had. And his, his contemporaries never denied any of the miracles. It's interesting when you read the Gospels, the thing that really gets in trouble, you get Jesus in trouble, is, is not even the miracles. In fact, nobody denies that a miracle took place, but generally they're mad about the way he did it or what day it was. Uh, kind of splitting, sp splitting hairs on that, but no one ever denied those miracles. In fact, even the final miracle that we'll talk about on Easter, his contemporaries had to do a cover-up. In fact, you'll see that in the Gospels that they were trying to tell the soldiers and anybody that was there at the tomb, here's the story you're going to tell. Because it made no sense that that tomb was empty. That smelly football team could not have done all that. I'm telling you. What is God going to do for you today? What will it take for you to trust Jesus for the first time or to trust him for your tomorrow? Nothing is impossible. Jesus said that. With God, nothing is possible.
Nothing is impossible. And so what is that thing in your life that you feel like is impossible? What is that thing you think there's no way God could come through? What if he could make your impossible possible? What if he could do that for you? I mean, imagine if, if you and I, if we could trust in the extraordinary, that God could take our ordinary and make something extraordinary. And here's the only thing I, I really want to say today. This is a big point. God controls it all. There's nothing outside his realm of control. Now, again, there's mystery to it. I don't know why sometimes God seems to step in, other times he doesn't, but he's got everything under control. We can trust him. If you're in a boat that's taking on water right now, he's asking us to trust him. He's asking us to trust him. Are we willing to do that? God controls it all. Trust him. Trust his story. Trust his love revealed to us in the scriptures. Trust the miracles. Trust creation. He's the one who made creation anyway. He spun these worlds into existence. And he's saying, I got you. I got you. I got your back. Trust him because he controls it all. In fact, one of the early church leaders the Apostle Paul, one of the church planters, he wrote this in the end of chapter 8 of one of his letters to the Romans. And this letter is great because we can trust God and trust his love no matter what. He says in Romans chapter 8, starting with verse 37, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us. He loves us that much, and he's asking us to trust him. He's saying, look, I just showed you over and over again that I control everything. I control the elements. I can can do that. I I have it covered. You can trust me. That's what he's asking us to do. There was a song we used to sing as kids. I want to see if you can sing it with me. He's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole, come on, world. You heard this song. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hand. We sing that as kids. Then something happens when we become adults. We stop believing that. I think Jesus would have us start believing that again. That he has the whole world in his hands. And we may not understand everything. Stuff happens. Uh, Rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. We get that. But he has the whole world in his hands. What are you afraid of? That, that, That question that he asked his disciples on that boat. What are you afraid of? I command it all. Let us trust him. We did this last several weeks. But here's what I want you to do. Really be thinking this week. If God controls everything and we can trust him, we need to ask big. Ask for what it is. What is that thing in your life, that miracle that you need Jesus to do, that number 38 that you need for you? What is that you need from Jesus? Ask him for the big, make the big request, and then believe that he can deliver and trust him for the timing. That's the hard one. But trust him for the timing. Do you believe he's got the whole world in his hands? Trust him. I want to pray with us here in a minute, but if you're here today, you've never said yes to Jesus, you've never said yes to following him, this could be your day, you could take a a next step of faith, even online you can do that, Uh, we'd love to pray with you on what that next step might be, we all have next steps to take, and for some of us who've said yes to Jesus, our next step is to make that big request, We we need to ask God for what that is, and believe that he can deliver, so wherever you're at on that spectrum, God has a next step for you today. Now let's pause for a word of prayer and ask God to do the miraculous. Father, we thank you for your love and faithfulness. We lean in to your love, but truly, Father, we also lean into your power. You command all the elements. You command it all. You have the whole world in your hands. Help us to trust you, to trust you. Father, help us to, to, to by faith, believe that you're still doing miracles. Father, do the miraculous through us and our church family, and that we would show the world your great love by what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.